Chapter 14 of The God of All Comfort. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Carol Kucher. The God of All Comfort by Hannah Whitehall Smith. 14. The Shout of Faith. And when ye hear the sound of the trumpet, all the people shall shout with a great shout, and the wall of the city shall fall down flat, and the people shall ascend up every man straight before him. The shout of a steadfast faith is an experience that is in direct contrast to the moans of a wavering faith, and to the wails of discouraged hearts, both of which we have been considering in our last two chapters. In the history of the children of Israel there were many occasions when they indulged in these moanings and wailings, and always to their sad undoing. But on one occasion at least they gave a magnificent shout of steadfast faith that brought them a glorious victory. And among the many secrets of the Lord that are discovered by the soul in its onward progress, I do not know of any that is more practically valuable than the secret of this shout of faith. The occasion when it took place was at the time when the Israelites had just crossed the river Jordan, and were about to take possession of the promised land. God had said to Joshua, just before they crossed, Now therefore arise, go over this Jordan, thou and all this people, unto the land which I do give to them, even to the children of Israel. Every place that the sole of your foot shall tread upon, that have I given unto you, as I said unto Moses. With this warrant they had crossed the river and entered into the land, no doubt expecting to get immediate possession. But at once upon their entrance they were brought face to face with one of those cities great and walled up to heaven that had so discouraged the heart of the spies forty years before. Well might they be appalled at the sight of it. To the eye of sense there seemed no possibility that they could ever conquer Jericho. They had no engines of warfare with which to attack it and one can easily imagine the despair that must have seized upon them when they found themselves confronted with the walls and fortresses of such a city. But the Lord had said to Joshua, See, I have given into thine hand Jericho, and the king thereof, and the mighty men of valor. He had not said, I will give, but I have given. It belonged to them already, but now they were called upon to take possession of it, it was as if a king should bestow an estate upon a courtier who was away in a foreign land, and this courtier should come back to take possession of it. But the great question was, how? It looked impossible. But the Lord declared his plan, and after a few directions as to the order of their march and blowing of their trumpets, he closed with these strange words. And it shall come to pass, that when they make a long blast with the ram's horn, and when ye hear the sound of the trumpet, all the people shall shout with a great shout, and the wall of the city shall fall down flat, and the people shall ascend up every man straight before him. Joshua 6, verse 5. Strange words, but true, for it came to pass just as the Lord had said. On the seventh day, when the priests blew with the trumpets, Joshua said to the people, Shout, for the Lord hath given you the city. And it came to pass, when the people heard the sound of the trumpet, and the people shouted with a great shout, that the walls fell down flat, so that the people went up into the city, every man straight before him, and they took the city. Now no one can suppose for a moment that this shout caused the walls to fall. And yet the secret of their victory lay in just this shout. For it was the shout of a faith which dared, on the authority of God's word alone, to claim a promised victory, while as yet there were no signs of this victory being accomplished. And according to their faith God did unto them, so that when they shouted, he made the walls to fall. God had declared that he had given them the city, and faith reckoned this to be true. Unbelief might well have said, It would be better not to shout until the walls do actually fall, for, should there be any failure about it, the men of Jericho will triumph, and we shall bring dishonor on the name of our God. But faith laughed at all such prudential considerations, and confidently resting on God's word, gave a shout of victory, while yet to the eye of sense that victory seemed impossible. 
And long centuries afterward, the Holy Ghost thus records this triumph of faith in Hebrews. By faith, the walls of Jericho fell down after they were compassed about seven days. Faith, mighty faith, the promise sees and looks at that alone, laughs at impossibilities, and cries, it shall be done. Jehoshaphat is another example of this shout of faith. He was told that a great multitude was coming up against him from beyond the sea, and he realized that he and his people had no might against them, and he could not tell what to do. He did not waste time and his energies in trying to prepare engines of warfare, or in arranging plans for a battle, but he at once set himself to seek the Lord. He stood in the congregation of the people and said, O Lord God of our fathers, art not thou God in heaven? And rulest not thou over all the kingdoms of the heaven? And in thine hand is there not power and might, so that none is able to withstand thee? Art not thou our God, who didst drive out the inhabitants of this land before thy people Israel, and gavest it to the seed of Abraham thy friend forever? And now, behold, the children of Ammon and Moab and Mount Seir come to cast us out of thy possession, which thou hast given us to inherit. O our God, wilt thou not judge them? For we have no might against this great company that cometh against us, neither know we what to do, but our eyes are upon thee. To this appeal the Lord answered through the mouth of his prophet in the following words, Thus saith the Lord unto you, Be not afraid nor dismayed by reason of this great multitude, for the battle is not yours but God's. Ye shall not need to fight in this battle. Set yourselves, stand ye still, and see the salvation of the Lord with you. O Judah and Jerusalem, fear not, nor be dismayed. Tomorrow go out against them, for the Lord will be with you. Without a thought of doubt, Jehoshaphat and the children of Israel believed the word of the Lord, and began at once to praise him beforehand for the victory that they were sure was coming. The next morning they rose early and went out to meet their enemy. And Jehoshaphat, instead of exhorting them as an ordinary general would have done, to look to their arms and to be brave in battle, simply called upon them to have a courageous faith. Hear me, O Judah, and ye inhabitants of Jerusalem, he said. Believe in the Lord your God, so shall ye be established. Believe his prophets, so shall ye prosper. Jehoshaphat then consulted with the people, and as their faith proved equal to his own, they appointed singers to go out before the army to sing praises as they went forward to meet the enemy. And it came to pass that when they began to sing and to praise, the Lord began to set ambushments against the enemy, so that they smote one another. And when the children of Israel came to a watchtower in the wilderness, from which they could see the great multitude that had come up against them, behold, they were dead bodies fallen to the earth, and none escaped. By this wonderful method of warfare they were made even more than conquerors, for they were three days in gathering the spoil. It was so much. David's fight with Goliath is another example of this method of victory. To the eye of sense David had no chance whatever of conquering the mighty giant, who had been defying the armies of Israel. But David, looking with the eye of faith, could see the unseen divine forces that were fighting on his side. And when Saul said to him, Thou art not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him, for thou art but a youth, and he a man of war from his youth, David stood firm in his faith, and after recounting some of his past deliverances, said calmly, The Lord that delivered me out of the paw of the lion and out of the paw of the bear, he will deliver me out of the hand of this Philistine. Saul, partly convinced by this strong faith, said, Go, and the Lord be with thee. He could not, however, quite give up all trust in his own accustomed armor, and he armed David with a helmet of brass, and a coat of mail, and his own powerful sword, and David essayed to go. But David soon found that he would not be able to fight in this sort of armor, and he put it off, and took instead the simple weapons that the Lord had blessed before, his staff and his sling, and five smooth stones out of the brook, and thus equipped he drew near to the giant. When the giant saw the stripling who had come to fight him, he disdained him, and said contemptuously, Come to me, and I will give thy flesh to the fowls of the air and the beasts of the field. 
and truly to the eye of the sense it looked as though this must necessarily be the end of such an apparently unequal battle. But David's faith triumphed, and he shouted a shout of victory before even the battle had begun. Thou comest to me, he said, with a sword, and with a spear, and with a shield, but I come to thee in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom thou defiest. This day will the Lord deliver thee into mine hand, and I will smite thee, and take thy head from thee, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. And all this assembly shall know that the Lord saveth not with sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hands. In the face of such faith as this, what could even a giant do? Every word of that triumphant shout of victory was fulfilled, and the mighty enemy was delivered into the hands of the stripling he had disdained. And so it will always be. Nothing can withstand the triumphant faith that links itself to omnipotence, for this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. The secret of all successful warfare lies in this shout of faith. It is a secret incomprehensible to those who know nothing of the unseen divine power that waits on the demands of faith, a secret that must always seem, to those who do not understand it, the height of folly and imprudence. We are all called to be good soldiers of Jesus Christ, and to fight the good fight of faith against worse enemies than those which attacked the Israelites. Our enemies are interior, and the giant that defies us is the strength of our temptations and the powerlessness of our own strength to resist. It is a hard and often a very discouraging fight, and many of God's children are weighed down under a dreary sense of apparently hopeless failure. They have sinned and repented again so often that they can see no hope of victory and are ready to despair. They hate sin, and they love righteousness, and they long for victory, but the good that they would they do not, and the evil that they would not that they do. In the language of the apostle, they find a law in their members warring against the law of their mind, and bringing them into captivity to the law of sin that is in their members. They know they ought to conquer, but they do not know how. And it is for these that this chapter is written. If they can but discover the secret of this shout of faith, they will know how, for it is absolutely certain that it never fails to bring victory. In John 16.33, our Lord reveals the ground of this triumphant shout of faith. Be of good cheer, he says, for I have overcome the world. Not I will overcome, but I have overcome. It is already done, and nothing remains but for us to enter into the power of it, Joshua did not say to the people, Shout, for the Lord will give you the city, but shout, for he hath given it. It has always seemed to me that it must have drained all Joshua's willpower to his lips to render it possible for him to make such a statement, in face of the fact that the walls of the city were at that very minute standing up as massive and as impregnable as ever. But God was a reality to Joshua, and he was not afraid to proclaim the victory that had been promised even before it was accomplished. There is a great difference between saying the Lord will give and the Lord hath given. A victory promised in the future may be hindered or prevented by a thousand contingencies, but a victory already accomplished cannot be gainsaid. And when our Lord assures us, not that he will overcome the world, but that he has already done so, he gives an assured foundation for a shout of the most triumphant victory. Henceforth the forces of sin are a defeated and demoralized foe, and, if we believe the words of Christ, we can meet them without fear, since we have been made more than conquerors through him who loves us. It is a well-known fact that as long as a defeated army can keep its defeat a secret, it can still make some show of resistance. But the moment it finds out that its defeat is known, it loses all heart and becomes utterly demoralized, and has no resource left but to retreat. The secret then lies in this that we must meet sin not as a foe that has yet to be conquered, but as one that has already been conquered. When Rahab helped the spies who had been sent by Joshua to escape from the king of Jericho, she made this confession. 
I know that the Lord hath given you the land, and that your terror is fallen upon us, and that all the inhabitants of the land faint because of you. If we were gifted with eyes that could see the unseen kingdom of evil, I believe we also should find that a terror and faintness has fallen upon all the forces of that unknown region, and that they see in every man and woman of faith a sure and triumphant conqueror. It is because we do not know this secret that we meet our spiritual enemies with such fear and trembling, and suffer such disastrous defeats. A Christian I know, who had been fearfully beset by temptation against which she had seemed to struggle in vain, was told this secret by one who had discovered it. It brought conviction at once, and she went forth to a fresh battle with the assurance of an already accomplished victory. It is needless to say that she was victorious, and she said afterward that it seemed to her as if she could almost hear the voice of the tempter saying as he slunk away, Alas, it is all up with me now. She had found out the secret. She knows that I am an already conquered foe, and I am afraid I shall never be able to overcome her again. We are told that for this purpose the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil, and again, Ye know that he was manifested to take away our sins, and in him is no sin. And again, now once in the end of the world hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. We must accept it as a fact, therefore, that sin is for us a conquered foe. And if our faith will only lay hold of this fact, reckoning sin to be dead to us, and ourselves to be dead to sin, and will dare, when we come in sight of temptation, to raise the shout of victory. We shall surely find, as the Israelites did, that every wall will fall down flat, and that a pathway will be opened straight before us to take the city. Our enemies are giants now just as truly as they were in Israel's day, and cities as great as Jericho, with walls as high, confront us in our heavenly pathway. Like the Israelites of old, we have no human weapons with which to conquer them. Our armor, like theirs, must be the armor of God. Our shield is the same invisible shield of faith that protected them, and our sword must be, as theirs was, the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word, that is, the promises and declarations of God. When our faith puts on this armor of God, and lays hold of this sword of the Spirit, and we confront our enemy with a shout of undaunted faith, we cannot fail to conquer the mightiest giant, or to take the strongest city. But alas, how different is the usual method of our Christian warfare! Instead of a triumphant shout of victory, we meet our temptations with feeble resolutions, or with futile arguments, or with half-hearted self-upbraiding, or, failing all else, with despairing prayers. O oh Lord, save me! we cry, O oh Lord, deliver me. And when no deliverance has come, and the temptation has swept aside all our arguments and all our resolutions, and we have been grievously defeated, then we have cried out in our despair that God has failed us, and that there is for us no truth in the Apostle's declaration that with every temptation there is a way of escape that we may be able to bear it. This is the usual and the unsuccessful way of meeting temptation, as many of us know to our cost. But what we ought to do is very different. We must recognize it as a fact that sin is a conquered foe, and must meet it, therefore, with a shout of victory instead of with a cry for help. Where we prayed that the Lord would save us, we must make now the assertion that He does save us, and that He saves us now. We must add the little letter S to the word save, and make it the present instead of the future tense. The walls may look as high and as immovable as ever, and prudence may say it is not safe to shout until the victory is actually won. But the faith that can shout in the midst of the sorest stress of temptation, Jesus saves me, he saves me now, such a faith will be sure to win a glorious and a speedy victory. Many of God's children have tried this plan, and have found it to work far beyond even their expectations. Temptations have come in upon them like a flood, temptations to irritability, or to wicked thoughts, or to bitterness of spirit, or to a thousand other things, and they have seen their danger, and their fears and their feelings have declared that there was no hope of escape. 
but their faith has laid hold of this grand fact that Christ has conquered, and they have fixed their gaze on the unseen power of God's salvation, and have given their shout of victory, The Lord saves, He saves me now, I am more than conqueror through Him that loves me. And the result is always a glorious victory. It may sometimes seem so impossible that the Lord can or does save that the words will not say themselves inside, but have had to be said out loud, forcing one's lips to utter them over and over, shutting one's eyes and closing one's ears against every suggestion of doubt, no matter how plausible it may seem. These declarations of faith often seem untrue at first, so apparently real are the seen reasons for doubt and discouragement. But the unseen facts are truer than the seen, and if the faith that lays hold of them is steadfastly persisted in, they never fail in the end to prove themselves to be the very truth of God. According to our faith, it always must be unto us sooner or later, and when we shout the shout of faith, the Lord invariably gives the victory of faith. I knew a Christian man who had entered upon this life of faith. He had naturally a violent temper, and went about his work among his ungodly companions, was sorely beset with temptations to give way to it. He knew it was wrong, and he struggled valiantly against it, but all in vain. Finally, one morning, on his way to work, he called in despair at the house of his Christian teacher and told him his difficulties. After explaining the suddenness of the temptations that came upon him, and the lack of time even to pray for help before he was overcome, he said, Now can you tell me of any short road to victory, something that I can lay hold of just at the needed moment? Yes, replied the minister. When the temptation comes, at once lift up your heart to the Lord, and by faith claim the promised victory. Shout the shout of faith, and the temptation will flee before you. After a little explanation of the glorious fact that sin is an already conquered foe, the man seemed to understand, and went on his way to take his place in the ranks with his fellow men at the station where they were engaged in hauling freight. As usual, he was met by taunts and sneers, and in addition he found that they had jostled him out of his rightful place in the ranks. The temptation to anger was almost overwhelming, but folding his arms, he said inwardly over and over, Jesus saves me. He saves me now. At once his heart was filled with peace, and the victory was complete. Again he was tried. A heavy box was so rolled as to fall on his foot, badly injuring him. And again he folded his arms and repeated his shout of victory, and at once all was calm. And so the day passed on. Trials and temptations abounded, but his triumphant shout carried him safely through them all, and the fiery darts of the enemy were all quenched by the shield of faith which he continually lifted up. Nighttime found him more than conqueror through him who loved him, and even his fellow carmen were forced to own the reality and the beauty of a religion that could so triumph over their aggravating assaults. The psalmist, after telling of the enemies who were daily trying to swallow him up, declared triumphantly, When I cry unto thee, then shall mine enemies turn back. This I know, for God is for me. Dear reader, do you know what the psalmist knew? Do you know that God is for you, and that he will cause your enemies to turn back? If you do, then go out to meet your temptations, singing a song of triumph as you go. Meet your very next temptation in this way. At this first approach, begin to give thanks for the victory. Claim continually that you are more than conqueror through him that loves you, and refuse to be daunted by any foe. Shout the shout of faith with Joshua, and Jehoshaphat, and David, and Paul. And I can assure you that when you shout, the Lord will set ambushments, and all your enemies shall fall down dead before you. End of chapter 14